Hello, I'm Deep Silence, and last time I introduced you to the Industrial Revolution add-on for Bedrock Edition. Today, we're talking about rotational motion and power generation. And what better way to get mechanical power into the game than with good old-fashioned water wheels and hand cranks? And this is a technical add-on that is all about automating your world. In terms of real-life inspiration, I wanted to give you the feeling that your world is exiting the feudal era and entering the industrial age of the 1800s. That means we've mechanized our production lines, we've improved our metallurgy, we've built new tools and machines, and we figured out new ways to exploit both the old and the newly discovered natural resources in our world. And of course, we've got to add a bit of that steampunk style feel too. Hence all the brass. So what does this mean for us? It means we need a source of rotational power. There are a couple of old-timey ways of creating rotational power. First you got your manual sweat equity powered hand crank device. Then there's your classic windmill, which I am definitely not avoiding because I haven't figured out how to do it yet. You also have steam engines, which I'm also definitely not avoiding either. Nope, not avoiding. And of course, you know what we're building up to. The good old reliable water wheel. Before I made any of these for the game though, I had a big problem. I had to actually figure out how to implement the mechanical logic. This has been the most complicated challenge so far. You see, once a mechanical block is placed, I have to figure out how it connects to other blocks when building out the mechanical network. I have to figure out how much stress is being produced and consumed, and I have to set the visual status for all of these blocks so you can actually see them all in action. And that last one is particularly important. I want to see all of the spinning shafts and gears. They make me happy. Well, let's tackle these problems one at a time. Because this is an open world sandbox game, you can put blocks down in whatever order and arrangement you feel like. That means I had to design a very flexible system that can figure out what the mechanical network does. And the first step in that process is parsing it. Now, parsing the network just means that I start at one block and go step by step to find all of the other blocks that connect to it. Starting with shafts, parsing seems like it should be straightforward. Shafts on the north-south axis should connect to shafts one block to the north or south. But I only want to have one shaft block. I don't want to have one block for shafts to only connect north-south, a separate one for east-west, and a third for up and down. It would be a miserable experience if you had to craft three different shafts that are all locked to only one cardinal axis. You want to make one shaft and then place it in any direction you want, just like you would expect blocks to be placed in vanilla Minecraft. And as much as this add-on departs from vanilla Minecraft, it is important to me to keep as much of the vanilla feel as I can. So to solve this problem, I came up with the absolute block prototype system. Within each block's definition, I have a state for the spin direction, clockwise is one, counterclockwise is negative one, and a speed, zero through eight. Minecraft has limits on block permutations, so I decided to limit mechanical network speeds to powers of two. In other words, it can be two to the zero is one RPM, two to the first is two RPM, two to the second is four RPM, all the way up to 2 to the 8th is 256 RPM. I also have block tags that describe how the block connects in relative terms. For example, the shaft block has a shaft connection on its front and another shaft connection on its back as you're facing the block when you place it. The gearbox has a shaft connection on the front and right side and a counterspinning shaft connection on the back and left side. Next, I had to define what clockwise and counterclockwise rotation meant, because looking at a shaft spinning clockwise this way isn't the same as looking at a shaft spinning clockwise this way. It may look the same from these vantage points, but from this angle, you can clearly see they are not. So, I defined an absolute rotational direction as clockwise as you are facing north, east, or up. Now that I have that settled, I can calculate what I call an absolute block prototype for each block. 
This takes into account all of these relative definitions and transforms them into a common reference that can work with every other mechanical block. For the three block network here, the block prototype for the water wheel looks like this, the shaft like this, and the contra gearbox like this. Then the mechanical subsystem script takes a starting point and goes one possible block connection at a time to find everything that connects. Then comes step two. Once I've parsed each connected block, I now have a network map. This map includes a list of all blocks in the network, the stress producing block to align the network to, the total stress produced and consumed, and whether it's unloaded or not. Yes, I said unloaded. You see, it turns out that if you try to access block information for a block in an unloaded chunk, Minecraft will throw errors to the console like a toddler throws vegetables off the table at dinner time. That is what we call in technical terms, not ideal. So I made the design decision to just grind the metaphorical network to a halt if it extends into an unloaded chunk. Practically, this gives you, at a minimum, a four chunk radius to work with, or a 128 block diameter, which should be enough in most use cases. And if you have a beefcake of a PC like I do, and you turn your tick distance up to the maximum 12 chunks, that gives you a 384 block long network diameter limit. And if you still need more than that, well just build another network. <clears throat> so we have our network mapped, we know it's all in loaded chunks, and we know what block is driving alignment. Now what? Stress calculation is pretty straightforward. Some devices can add stress units, or SU, to the network. Uh, this water wheel is adding 512 SU and is spinning at 8 RPM. Other devices, like this shaft, don't add or subtract SU. I decided to assume that there are no efficiency losses in a system from transferring motion. You're welcome. Other blocks consume SU based on their speed. This mining drill consumes SU equal to four times its RPM, or 32 SU at this speed. You just add up the numbers while mapping and then see if consumed is more than produced. To help demonstrate this, I put together a quick network. This water wheel spins at 8 RPM and produces 512 SU. I used gear ratios to speed it up to 32 RPM and we're going to connect it to this series of mining drills one at a time. So when I connect the first one, you can see that we're producing 512 SU and each of these is consuming 128 for a total of 256. If I connect the next set, we're now producing 512 and consuming 512. Both of these networks stayed active. However, if I add into this third network, we are now consuming 768 and producing only 512, so the whole network grinds to a stop. Another design decision I made is that SU producers can't be reverse powered. In a real system, if I have a water wheel turning and I put enough torque on it in the other direction, it would slow down and eventually turn it the other way. That's a giant pain, and I didn't want to calculate that in code, and frankly, you probably don't want to play like that. This means your stress producers are immutable, or can't be changed by the alignment script. That assumption creates our final network state possibility, where you try to connect two networks that just can't be resolved. Like this. This network is now mechanically bound. I broke from the create mod in two ways here. First, their devices will all spin as driven by the fastest spinning component. And if you try to overspeed or bind a network, it will break that block on placement. I've decided to let you place it because I like seeing it all stop and tell you that you broke it so you can go fix it. Not only does it make my calculations easier, I think it adds a reasonable engineering challenge on you to make everything connect right. Now, the final step. The fun one. Making it spin. There are two ways I could have gone with this. The first is a flipbook texture. You've seen this before on blocks in vanilla Minecraft already, such as magma, fire, bubble columns, portal swirlies, and more. 
and while these look fine at reasonable speeds, slowing them down too much makes for a very jittery shaft. And that's not what I want at all. And believe me, I tried. I wanted to use flipbook textures because it would let me contain the entirety of the mechanical subsystem to blocks. But alas, I decided to use display entities. If you're not familiar, you have three basic types of things in Minecraft. Blocks, particles, and everything else. If it moves and it isn't a particle, it's probably an entity. Cow? Tasty entity. Zombie? Danger entity. Boats? Floaty entity. Item drop? Spinny entity. Player? Crafty entity. Entities tend to be derided by add-on developers, and for a good reason. They take a lot more processing power to handle every tick compared to blocks, which don't move. But a lot of that overhead comes from pathfinding and collision physics, so by disabling those, it lowers the cost significantly. Additionally, entities are the only way to do certain things. Uh, for example, inventory. Blocks can't do that. And most importantly for this add-on, motion. See this chest? This isn't actually the block being animated. Or maybe it is. I don't really know because all vanilla blocks are hard-coded, so we can't tell. Java has something called tile entities, which is an animatable block, but Bedrock doesn't have that. So we do the only thing we can and simulate a display entity. On a technical note, the display entity code in Industrial Revolution is encapsulated very well. The game developers have mentioned that they have bedrock tile entities on their radar, so if they do implement it, I will be able to make that change easily. But back to the present. When I place the block, the block handles all state, logic, and physics collisions. On placement, it summons a display entity, and when the network finishes recalculating and aligning, it sets each display entity to the corresponding state. The display entity then shows the appropriate animation. And that's it. It's not an easy topic to grasp, and it took me months of thinking, tinkering, crying, and coding. You'd be surprised how often those last two happen at the same time. To get the add-on to where it's at now. But the good news is that groundwork is a solid and robust base to build everything else on. It took me months to get that first shaft spinning. It took me a week for the gearboxes. It took me a day to set up the water wheel and the hand crank. I'll show you the cog shafts later, but they only took three days to implement because well, I had to figure out new connection paths. My point is, this is a systems-based add-on. It focuses on giving you engineering tools to do cool things. And you know what? I'm glad to be here and take you on this journey with me. Teaching about how it works and helping you figure it out is part of the fun for me. So, keep learning and go find your way.